We also spent a lot of time looking at the side chain. So this is DOM, but we did it with the DOB analog. And we played with the side chain. We made five-membered rings, six-membered rings, uh, incorporated into big rings, etc. <clears throat> so here was a cyclopropyl up here. We made a cyclopropyl. We made a cyclobutyl. We made a five-membered ring here. Then we made a four-membered ring. And this is over a period of 25 years. We finally got this as TCB2. It's actually used, it's supplied by a commercial company now as an agonist for the 2A receptor. It's not a controlled substance, um, but it's too expensive to buy for recreational purposes. <coughs> anyway, so we, mapped, so we mapped out the orientation of the methoxies, and we've orient, mapped out the orientation of the side chain. So if you look at this, side chain comes out, comes up, and projects over. And this is actually, it's two stereoisomers I've shown the uh, active isomer, you could have the other isomer. So we know which one, we did X-ray crystallography, we know which one binds. So we know pretty well what the shape of these phenethylamines is when they bind to the receptor. We started work on homology modeling and neogenesis um, about 2001, so it's been a few years. <clears throat> they published a crystal structure of bovine rhodopsin, which is the pigment, the photopigment in the eyes and it's bovine rhodopsin because they go to the slaughterhouse and get lots of cow eyes and isolate the protein. And um, it turns out that this is a GPCR, but in normally it's, uh, what it has bound in here is a, is, is a uh, molecule called cis-retinal, which is a photopigment that comes from vitamin A. It's why they tell you to eat carrots and get vitamin A because this is part of where it goes into the pigment in your eye. So what he did was some computer uh, molecular dynamics, rigid body dynamics, and what we did with the computer is we isomerized the cis. So the cis retinal has got a double a double bond. It's like this, and when a photon hits it, it isomerizes and flips to trans. So we did that in the computer. We flipped it to trans, and then we <clears throat> then minimized this to get an active structure. And so we used that activated structure to do our early homology models. So a homology model, basically there are uh, critical amino acids in the GPCRs that are sort of like fingerprints. And they exist in all the family A GPCRs and they're necessary to hold the receptor into this bundle that looks like this. These are just uh, cylinders. <clears throat> and so you can convert this over just by converting the amino acids in rhodopsin into the amino acids that are in the 2A receptor. There's a little more to it than that, but you can come up with a homology model of the 2A receptor based on an activated rhodopsin. And we used that quite successfully. I should tell you, last month a crystal structure was published for the human serotonin 2B receptor, which is very close to the human 2A receptor. It just came out in science, and I have a colleague back at Purdue now who we have quickly converted it into a 2A receptor with LSD bound. And we're now going through and doing a lot of studies to look at some of our more recent mutagenesis data. <clears throat> I know that there are attempts now being made to uh, crystallize the 2A and 2C receptors. And it may be that in the coming year, we'll actually see a structure of the serotonin 2A receptor come out in the literature, which then we can really start looking at detailed models and, and figuring out what's going on. Here's a close-up of LSD and the 2A receptor. <clears throat> and it binds in basically in where you see. And there are some residues here that we know are important. Um, in helix 5, most of the GPCRs have determinants of specificity in helix 5. This is helix 5. It has a serine 239 and a serine 242. And they're about a third of the way the top of the receptor, so they're about a third of the way down. There's an asparagine at the top of helix 6, which no one has paid any attention to. Uh, if we get our paper published, we'll be the first to really point out what it's doing there. There's an aspartate in helix 3, and this aspartate is what interacts with the charged amine in LSD or the amino group of DOI, etc. <clears throat> There's also a 3 enine 160 down here, which no one has paid any attention to and which we found is important for activation of these receptors. So try to keep in mind uh, the serine 239, the serine 242, the 3 enine 160, and this asparagine 343. Serine 239, we had showed, and I have a slide, we've shown previously that that serine is one that hydrogen bonds to the hydroxy of serotonin, the 5-hydroxy. So that's absolutely a critical uh, serine residue. Serine 242, less is known about it, and in the, ser in the human 2C receptor, serotonin 2C receptor, that's an alanine. And so all these drugs 
all the psychedelics have high affinity for the 2C receptor as well, and it has an alanine down here. So that means probably there's no hydrogen bonding going on in that receptor in that region. <clears throat> so this is a study we published some years ago. Michael Braden did this. And what this represents is a change in free energy of binding. Uh, remember I showed you in those affinities, you could calculate a free energy of binding, delta G was minus RT natural log of the, the affinity, Ka. So we did that. And so these are delta Gs and their changes in free energy based on these mu mutations. So here's serine 239. We mutate it to an alanine. An alanine is just a methyl, it's not polar. So serine 239 mutated to an alanine serine-242 mutated to an alanine. And this represents a decrease in binding affinity. <clears throat> and right around here is a, the difference of one about one uh, hydrogen bond. So you can see we've got a pretty significant effect when we mutate serine-239 to an alanine. And there's serine, uh, serotonin itself. You really knock its affinity out when you mutate that top serine-239 to an alanine. The 242 still has a big effect, but it's less uh, effective than the 239 mutation. <clears throat> now look at LSD. 239 has, has no effect on the affinity of LSD when you mutate it, but 242 has an effect that's about comparable to, ser to uh, ser uh, serotonin itself. Silicin, again, we see that the 239 is important for binding. If we knock it out, we lose affinity. 242 is less important. 5-methoxy-DMT. Again, we see effect like serotonin itself. 239 is very important for binding, and 242 is less important. 5-methoxytryptamine, similar although less pronounced effects, and this is just the tryptamine rather than the n and dimethyltryptamine. Now, here's interesting: 5-methoxy isopropyl tryptamine and methyl serotonin. This is 5-methoxytryptamine, uh, and the, the nitrogen in the indole was an NH. We put an isopropyl on there, so that's a carbon with two more carbons on it. So it's a big hydrophobic group that sticks off of the nitrogen indole. And look what happened here. We actually saw a dramatic increase in affinity with the 242. A loss with 239 mutation, but a big gain in affinity when we convert it to an alanine. And with methyl serotonin, this is a methyl on the indole nitrogen. You know the, the structure of the NH on the indole. Put a methyl on there, and we see Again, an increase in affinity for methyl serotonin. But when we knock out 239, we see a loss. <clears throat> and basically, our conclusion was 239, serine 239 at the top of helix 5 is the one that's interacting or engaging with the 5 oxygen in serotonin and in 5 methoxytryptamine and probably the 4 hydroxy in silicin. But that 242 is less important, and if we stick things on the nitrogen that are hydrophobic, the affinity increases. So there had been previous studies done looking at the 2A versus the 2C receptor. The 2A receptor, that residue 242 is a serine, it's a, an OH, a hydrogen bonding. 2C is an alanine. And when they had put an N-methyl onto ergolines, ergot derivatives, they saw that their affinity in the 2C receptor was much higher. Um, <coughs> Howard Sard at Organics and his colleagues there had taken silicin and put an N-methyl on silicin. And all of a sudden, they see a dramatic increase in affinity at the 2C receptor. So they actually patented these as selective 2C receptor agents. So based on what I'll show you later, we think that the indole NH is pointing toward serine 242. And that when you put these large alkyl groups on here, it knocks out affinity at the 2A receptor. But that makes this receptor more like the 2C receptor. And so affinity goes up in the 2C receptor because you have an alanine there. Did everybody follow that? If you don't have a whiteboard or anything, I should have requested one, but I didn't think about it in time. <clears throat> we also know that these drugs have uh, distinct binding profiles. And for example, <clears throat> we have tryptamines here. We have DOI as a representative of the 2,5-dimethoxy substitute compounds. Mescaline, escaline, and isoposcaline. These differ just with escaline has a methoxy in the 4 position, and isoposcaline has an isopropoxy in the 4 position. And what you see with the red colors is a decrease in affinity. So this is the wild-type receptor with no mutations. 
And now when we mutate threonine 160, which is down in helix 3 at the bottom, we mutate that to an alanine, we see our affinity goes from 5 to 72 here, from 7 to 360, from 4 to 280. And this number in parentheses is its intrinsic activity relative to serotonin. So it's 100% here, but 50%, 100 goes to 50, 100 goes to 70. If we mutate serine-242 to an alanine, we see a fourfold loss. It still retains its 100%. That's the standard for serotonin. Fourfold loss here, uh, about what, a sixfold, sevenfold loss here, sevenfold loss here. So 242 has less of an effect, but still is detrimental if we mutate it to alanine. And this nitrogen-343, which nobody has looked at, Look at what happens when we mutate that to an alanine. The affinity of serotonin drops off by 100-fold. 7 by over 10-fold, 4, 15-fold. So that asparagine at the top helix 6 is doing something, and no one has actually studied that. We're probably going to be, I hope, the first ones to report that. We get that paper out this summer. <clears throat> DOI, you see uh, losses with uh, 160, but nothing with 343 or 242. And then mescaline is just the opposite. If we mutate this uh, threonine to an alanine, we see increased intrinsic activity, goes from 83% to 100%, and increased affinity. So it goes from 275 nanomolar to 190, 220 to 130. The same thing for 242. This is that serine below. Again, if we turn it into an alanine, we see we have almost doubled the affinity, almost tenfold. Well, 275 down to 60, six fold, seven, six, five, five fold increase, five fold increase. But 343, again, we see a big loss. So 343 is somehow involved in binding in a way that we don't yet understand. <clears throat> Just to show you the contrast. So what these data say is that phenethylamines and tryptamines bind differently and probably also differently from the 2,5-dimethoxies. So each of these classes of potential psychedelics has a different way that it binds in the receptor. So if you think of functional selectivity and those different signaling pathways, then it kind of makes sense. If they bind in a different way, they're going to be adopting a different shape conformation in the receptor. You're going to get a different shape overall of the receptor ligand complex. And then those intracellular loops are going to be in a different position. <clears throat> so, in our earliest homology model, that based on rhodopsin, here's sort of the way we rationalize that. So here's uh, serotonin binding. Here's that as asparagine and uh, one in transmembrane helix three. Here's a serine two thirty nine and serine two forty two. So we envision binding of the serine two thirty nine to the five hydroxy, and serine two forty two we think is an acceptor for a hydrogen bond from this indole NH. And in the wild type receptor. The affinity is about 5 nanomolar, and the EC50 is about 5 nanomolar. When we mutate 239 <clears throat> to an alanine, now there's no longer any interaction here. And you see we went from 5 to 50 and 5 to 100. So we had a 10 to 20-fold loss in affinity and potency by mutating this residue from serine to alanine. <clears throat> by contrast, if we look at the 242, let's see. Let's see how far back. I may have dropped a slide out of here. <clears throat> so in the wild type, we have 5 nanomore affinity and 5 nanomore EC50. And when we mutate this one, I dropped out the intermediate slide, I mutate this one from serine to alanine. We no longer have this interaction, but it's not as dramatic effect. We go from 5 to 20 instead of 5 to 50, and 5 to 20 instead of 5 to 100. So 242 is less important. And again, in that slide where I showed we had the N-methyl serotonin and the isopropyl methoxytryptamine, that group, and N-methyl would be projecting down here, and we'd expect then we'd see Van der Waals interactions, which would increase the affinity for the receptor. <coughs> With LSD, we saw that there was almost no effect of mutating serine-239 versus some effect at serine-242. So if we dock LSD in the receptor, here's the wild-type KI, 0.4 nanomolar. This is a human receptor. EC50, a 0.2 nanomolar. 
and now we're going to mutate this from a serine to an alanine. And you see the serine has nothing really to interact with over here. This is an aromatic ring. This is a polar OH group. We mutate it to an alanine. Now you see there's no change in affinity and only about a threefold uh, decrease in uh, decrease in potency. So it doesn't have much in effect if you think back to the serotonin numbers. Now if we look at the effect of serine 242, again we start with a wild type 0.4 nanomore affinity and 0.7 nanomore EC50. Now we mutate that one. See we see about a fourfold loss in affinity, a twofold loss in potency. Again, this is much less dramatic than with serotonin. So <clears throat> we can understand why serine 239 is not important for binding of LSD. And this interaction here is not that important. Uh, we know from the literature that if you put a methyl on LSD or some larger group, that if you do this, you'll see increased affinity. So we're pretty sure that this is the direction that that indole NH pokes for the phenethylamine or for the tryptamines. And this is some data we haven't published um, from John McCorby, my last graduate student. And so here we have a bunch of compounds. So here's uh, serotonin, 5-methoxytryptamine, and 5-methyltryptamine. And we have 239, 242, 343, and 3 and 160. And here's the code. If it's red, it makes it worse. If it's green, it makes it better, essentially. So if we look at the tryptamines, 239 is that top serine that binds to the 5 oxygen of serotonin. So if we mutate it to an alanine, you see uh, in the wild type, we see a big drop off in affinity. 5 methoxy, a big drop off in affinity. But 5 methyl, we see an increase in affinity. Because this methyl group now, when we mutate this from a serine to an alanine, we have an alanine and alanine interacting. So now we have those van der Waals interactions that increase the affinity. 243 is also uh, something we don't understand. Uh, we mutate it to alanine, we see a tenfold loss in affinity, no effect on 5-methoxytryptamine, and an increase in affinity if we have 5-methyl. With 242, 5-methoxytryptamine is the only one that gives a slight decrease. And now 3-anine-160, which no one has ever talked about in the literature, if we mutate that to an alanine, every one of these molecules in the tryptamine series are affected detrimentally in terms of their affinity, and even tryptamine itself. Here's N1-methyltryptamine and N1-ethyltryptamine. So this is take the methyl off and put an ethyl, a methyl, a one-carbon piece, or a two-carbon piece here. And serine-242, we see in both cases, for going from 470 nanomore down to 62, a big increase in affinity, 370 down to 36, about a tenfold increase in affinity. Again, suggesting that 242 is interacting with the position where that indole NH is. <clears throat> Here's tryptamine, methyltryptamine, and ethyl. And so when we put methyl and ethyl here in 242 and this turning it to an alanine, we see increased affinity. Again, I don't, I don't know what to tell you about T160. We're hoping that in our newest homology model, which we're just finishing now based on the crystal structure of the 2B, that when we dock these, that we'll be able to figure out what uh, T160 does. We have an idea of what uh, asparagine 373 does because we think it bridges across in hydrogen bonds either to the ligand or to serine 239. Um, but exactly why that we see this range of changes, we'll have to actually dock the molecules to see if that makes any sense. <coughs> So the tryptamine binding pose, we think, looks something like this. Um, serine-239 hydrogen bonds to the 5-OH uh, of serotonin or methoxy of methoxy tryptamines. Serine-242, we think, uh, is a hydrogen bond acceptor for the indole NH. But if it has a methyl here, then you lose affinity. And in the serotonin 2C receptor, this residue is an alanine. And it has these have high affinity uh, for alanine. Serine-242 in the receptor, if you look at the receptor, serine-242 is about the same level as 3 and 160 And in a lot of the crystallized receptors, there's uh, serine-242 is hydrogen bonding to 3 and 160 or the, the corresponding residue. So we think that um, in the serotonin 2C receptor where this is an alanine, 3 and 160 may be hydrogen bonding. So we're showing this because we know there's an effect 
and it's possibly related to the interaction that occurs down here. <coughs> so here's another uh, bit of uh, data. So we made a lot of uh, ligands, like for example, uh, 5 ethyl DOM and 2 ethyl DOM, 5 hydroxy DOM. And we took methyls off and put them back on to see what would happen with the mutagenesis studies. So <coughs> basically, what you see is anything that has a hydroxy in the 5 position, uh, we mutate it to an alanine and <coughs> we lose uh, affinity. Let's see. 5 um, ethyl DOM. So that's uh, this molecule here. We don't have that 5-methoxy anymore, and there's no effect of mutation to an alanine. So this is suggesting that this oxygen in the 5 position, so this is a 2,5-dioxygenated pattern, but this oxygen in the 5 position is also the one that's interacting with 239, which is the one that binds to the 5-oxygen in the tryptamines. So there's that commonality, we think. <coughs> Um, and 343, you see it goes up and down depending on what you have here, so we haven't really figured that out. Serine-242 has almost no effect on most of these phenethylamines. And so we're kind of puzzled as to what the 5, what the 2 methoxy is doing. But 3 and 160 when we mutate that, almost all of these have increased affinity. So 3 and 160 is in, involved in some way that no one has yet uh, fathomed completely. Now, if we go to um, 2CB versus 2-hydroxy, 2 2CB, 2 where we took this O-methyl off, here's 2CB, uh, and you see if we uh, change this to an alanine, the affinity goes up about twofold. But if we have 2-hydroxy 2CB, if we mutate that, affinity drops off dramatically. So what we think happens here, and 242 is the same case, we see a big loss. What we think happens is actually that this 2-methoxy is projecting down in that lower region close to 242 and 3 160 In the earlier papers we published, we proposed that this 2-methoxy was binding to a serine residue that was below the aspartate in helix-3. Um, and actually, uh, David Glorian in Copenhagen did a model where he did um, guided uh, molecular dynamics, and he actually guided the 2-methoxy in that direction because we thought that's what happened. We don't think that happens now. We think this methoxy interacts with serine-239, but we think this methoxy is down in the region of 242 and 160 because when we put a hydroxy here, if you have a methoxy with 2CB, there's a methoxy. So if you convert this over to an alanine, it doesn't have much effect. Convert this to an alanine, it gets a little more favorable. But when you have a hydroxy there, that's binding, and you convert that to an alanine, or this to an alanine, you lose that favorable interaction. So it dramatically decreases it. So in terms of how these bind, we think it's something like this. Serine-239 hydrogen bonds to this 5-methoxy, or oxygen, um, but methoxy and the 2,5-dimethoxy compounds. The DOM, or, or 2CB, or DOB, this X is a methyl or halogen. The asparagine, we have not figured out what's going on completely, but we think it may hydrogen bond either to the 5-methoxy or to the serine-239, but it's involved in some way in engaging the top of the molecule. And this is a new thing uh, that we hope our docking studies will point out, is that the 2-methoxy of these compounds is interacting in this region between serine-242 and serine-160. And this is something that's new that no, you're the first people to hear that. Yeah. Um, we're hoping, uh, we've just done manual do docking. We're hoping that when we get it docked, that we'll see where the four position is pointing. Uh, there are some phenylalanines that I think are stacked together at the intersection between 5 and 6. And I think it's poked in there, but until we actually get an accurate dock orientation and get everything fit to see where that pokes. Uh, in the beginning, in helix 5, above serine 239, there's a glycine. And we thought, okay, there's a lot of space. Maybe it just makes space. But I don't think that's sufficient. I think there's a hydrophobic interaction that's, if you go out past the propyl, it's limited, which suggests it may be an aromatic ring. We had some earlier docking studies. I had a student, Jose Honcosa, who did a lot of um, modeling, and we weren't happy with the hydrogen bonding uh, potentials that were in the program and the pie stacking. And he actually uh, partitioned the oxygen 
the way these are done is a coulombic electrostatic interaction between the two uh, oxygens. And so he actually partitioned them into partial charges to, to mimic the electrons. And we got a dock structure there where um, the four position substituent was sticking in between the intersection of helix five and six. And there was a couple of aromatic residues and we thought oh, it looks really good. But then my computational chemist, Marcus Lill, said, yeah, it looks good, but you can't use it because you haven't validated that. So, he said, so I'm hoping that when we do it with the conventional software that we can see the same thing, because that, that would make complete sense. And we do have the model now, we just don't have all the dock ligands in there yet. And this is um, uh, mescaline and proscaline, gemscaline, pure mescaline. We did the same thing. We tied this back into a furan ring. That was the three DHF. And then we tied both of them back to see if the same thing happened that's happened in the phenethylamines where we got the, the dragonfly, bromo dragonfly. It doesn't happen. The compounds are less active. The more rings you put in, the less active they get. <coughs> Gemscaline was a molecule we made that has a five-membered ring here and is more potent than mescaline in, in all of our assays. So we threw that in. And we had escaline, postcaline, isoposcaline, four bromo where we put a bromine in four position, four methyl. This is Sasha called this desoxy. And the 3 5 dimethoxyphenethylamine where there was nothing here. And it's really hard to figure out what's happening here. Uh, clearly, serine 239 doesn't seem to be that important for most of these, except for this one. But for these mescaline analogs, it has almost no effect. And for the furo compound, since it's not active, we don't know if that means anything. A couple of them, you know, mescaline itself is not affected by the spare gene mutation. All of these, the serine 242 to alanine mutations, all give increased affinity. So there's something going on down at that level of serine 242, and also threonine 160 for many of them. So when we make this into from a, a polar serine into an alanine, it's telling us something about the interactions here. Maybe this methoxy is interacting down there, but this is a this is a real uh, a brain teaser. So at this point, um, what I'm going to say is I don't know how mescaline binds. It's not that potent though. If you look at the affinity. 800 nanomolar, I mean, uh, DOI is you know, less than one nanomolar, so LSD is 0. 4 nanomolar. So it's not a very potent compound. It's certainly interesting. Its pharmacology is very rich. It's one of the classic psychedelics, but it isn't very potent. So we don't know how it's binding, and I'm hoping that some docking studies to let the computer run a while will come up with some things that we, we that aren't intuitively obvious. And then I want to talk a little bit, and I may have talked about this in 2010, but since these uh, end bone compounds have become so important, I thought I would go back and just focus a little bit on these. <clears throat> this is a uh, 2,5-dimethoxyphenethylamine. And 2CD uh, would have a methyl, 2CB would have a bromo, 2CI would have an IO. We just use this uh, because it wasn't a controlled substance. It was easy to work with, and we could do the models. This doesn't have a very high affinity for the receptor. If you put a methyl group on here, affinity drops way off, and with a propyl, affinity is also way off. But when you put a benzyl group on, the affinity increases dramatically. And if you put an orthomethoxy benzyl, it's three nanomolar. So it's a, look at the difference. It's a more than 100-fold more potent when you put this orthomethoxy. And of course, when you put a bromo or an iota on here, the affinity of the iota compound, the 2,5-I in bone, the affinity is 0.04 nanomolar. So it's like one of the most potent compounds at the 5 ht 2 a receptor that anyone has ever found. And you probably are aware that a lot, there's been a lot of mischief with these compounds because of the potency that are being sold now and a couple of overdose deaths have occurred um, because people just aren't accustomed to seeing something that potent as a research chemical, if you will. Um, but they're putting it on blotters now and the dose of this stuff, I'm, I'm told, is somewhere between 200 and 700 micrograms. So anything that's that potent is uh, economically favorable because it's just easy to make. You get two CI and you throw in some and ortho aldehyde and borohydride, and you've got it. It's one step, and it's easy to make and uh, crystallize in large quantities. I tell people I'm glad it's not early active, or the market would be flooded with this stuff. <clears throat> I tell people I'm glad that this stuff is not early active. It apparently has the first, I get emails from these people that say, oh, you made this compound. The first email I got was a guy who said, oh, yeah, this 2,5-I N-bone is, is active. I said, oh, really? How'd you do it? It's rectally. Okay, 
But then I started hearing from people who are doing it uh, sublingually, and now it's in blotters that people stick in their gums and so forth. Apparently, it's not active orally. So that's what I said. If it was active orally, the, the world would be flooded with this stuff, I think, because it's so easy to make and it's so potent. So uh, we thought, well, why is it so potent? So in that first model we had, we docked it, and it looked to us like um, this uh, phenylalanine 339 was uh, doing an edge-to-face interaction with the, the aromatic ring that's attached to the nitrogen. So we actually mutated all, we have mutated on, in a couple of occasions, all the polar residues, the phenylalanines, even some of the loop residues to really get an idea coupled with our libraries of what's actually happening. <coughs> so, looking at when we mutate the phenylalanine to a leucine, so phenylalanine is an aromatic ring, leucine is an aliphatic chain. So you lose the aromatic character, you lose the pi stacking, although from, in terms of hydrophobicity, the leucine is similar to the phenylalanine. The receptors express well, they behave pretty normally. And so then we went back and checked all these in the mutant receptor. So in the mutant receptor, our affinity dropped off by about tenfold, eleven-fold for the 2,5-dimethoxyphenethylamine, dropped off about four and a half, five-fold for the methyl, dropped off about six-fold for the propyl. But when we had the n-benzyl, it dropped off 40-fold, and with the orthomethoxybenzyl, it dropped off 500-fold. So we were pretty sure that that uh, phenylalanine was important for engaging that appended n-benzyl. <coughs> We did determine that it was probably a hydrogen bond acceptor. These are data that uh, Michael Braden did, and I published in a review of these compounds uh, two years ago. But uh, an orthomethoxy and orthohydroxy, you see here's the affinity of the 2,5-I uh, end bone with the orthomethoxy. 0.04 nanom nanomolar is the affinity, so it's, re it's really a kick-ass compound. A 2-hydroxy is almost the same. Um, we didn't determine the 2-cyano, but in the rat receptor, you see the difference. It's not quite as potent in the rat receptor, but here's 0.09 nanomole, 0.09 nanomole, 0 0.12, 276 with an N-cyano, 0.84 with a carboxamido, an alcohol. We didn't determine these fluoros. The 2-fluoro can hydrogen bond, but not as well, and you see it's got some activity, but it's dropped way off. A 4-fluoro is not nearly as good. 2,3 methylene doxy again puts that oxygen back there, so it's 0,5 nanomolar affinity. 3,4, 3, 3,4 3, methylene doxy, it doesn't work as well, it shifts it around the ring. And 2 hydroxy, 4,5 methylene doxy uh, doesn't work as well. We also had some dihydro, uh, dihydrofuran, it also was good. So anything that puts a hydrogen bond ex acceptor in the ortho position here apparently increases this activity. <coughs> and. Uh, in uh, David Gorham's model, he proposes that that methoxy accepts a hydrogen bond from a tyrosine that's in helix 7. And with our new model, I'm not sure that that's the way it's going to turn out. We're really interested in where that residue is that interacts with that methoxy. The parent compound, where um, R is, oh, none of, none of these, as far as we know, are orally active. They're only active sublingually. I think it's because they're so hydrophobic, but I don't know. Yeah, this one uh, would just be 2,5 in bone without anything. If we have an I, it would be 2,5 I. The bone would be 2,5 B. The chlorine would be 2,5 C. So, but this one, uh, with this affinity, probably would be uh, active, but not nearly as active as the iodo and bromo compounds. There's a tremendous amount of mischief that could be done because you basically can put this thing on almost anything. Uh, any of the phenethylamines, 2CT, 2CT2, T2CT7, you could put on the flies. We've made some of them actually with bromo fly and bromo dragonfly and a bunch of them. And then in terms of affinity, they're all active. So it's a very simple transformation that leads to some really active compounds. But the auto compound, uh, this is the most potent one that we found in our series so far. You mean when you have the alpha methyl? Yeah, we made the alpha methyls, they're much less active. So and we don't know, and if you look at uh, the alpha methyl isomers, the R versus the S, the R is more active than the S. Um, 
the R, if you look at intrinsic activity or efficacy, that alpha methyl when it's in the R isomer increases it, whereas the S doesn't. So we've speculated that whatever that alpha methyl interacts with may be what this phenyl ring is interacting with. And so when you have the phenyl there, the methyl just produces some kind of a steric clash, can't wait in a steric clash, and so it doesn't bind to the But yeah, when you do it, start with DOI, DOI or DOB and do that, it doesn't, it's not as effective as when you start with the two C compound. Yes. Oh, no, no, on 2CB, 2CB fly, not dragonfly, yeah. Yeah, we've done 2CB. Yeah, no, it, 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 I don't remember what the numbers are on 2CB fly. We put it on about, it was so easy to do, we put on about everything we had that was had any amount of. Tom uh, made the TCB2, he put it on that molecule. It's also quite potent, but in the, in the receptor affinity. So it would look, I mean, hypothetically it would look something like this, where we have uh, serine 239 hydrogen bonding here. This is that old docking where we had the four position pointing over in this direction, and with phenylalanine 339 engaging here. And if you believe Glorium's model, this would be flipped over so the methoxy was on the down below where we couldn't see it, and would be engaging a hydrogen bond from the tyrosine and helix 7. <clears throat> Again, these are all hypothetical, uh, built on um, sort of de novo, activated homology models. Our first model was based on a computer and silico activated rhodopsin homology model. So as I said, in March we got the crystal structure of the 2B receptor, which is very similar to 2A. There's some differences in the, some of the residues, but we're, we've actually built a homology model with, based on that now. And uh, we're hoping that we'll get some better dockings. Because you know, imagine how these things, how you dock these things in silico. <clears throat> you have an optimal distance for a hydrogen bond. And if it's off by one or two tenths of an angstrom, then the computer doesn't pick it up like it should. And so if your model is off by, you know, if you've got these two residues separated by two tenths or three tenths of an angstrom too much, you're not going to be able to get a good docked orientation because it's too far for the computer to pick that up. So everything kind of has to be where it needs to be. So we're hoping that with this better model that we'll get some docking poses that can explain some of these things. Because uh, when we started doing it, the new genesis would tell us that things were binding in a certain way. But then when you dock and you'd say, well, the computer doesn't want to put it there. And then you go back and you would measure it and say, well, the distance is a little bit, just a little bit too far for this residue. So this was based on the one model where we had partitioned the oxygen electrons into partial charges. Um, but it presumably would look something like this. And probably when we get everything all said and done, if you squint real hard and look at this, it's probably going to look a lot like it does when we get the real docking. You can create the receptor. I mean, you can, you can make the receptor and express it. And that's what we do with the mutagenesis. But you can't see how it's actually docked in there. You need to crystallize it. And that's what we don't have. And I think it's going to be a long time before you see the structure of the serotonin 2A receptor with something like DOI or, sil or silicin crystallized in there. I think it's possible you might at some point see a crystal structure of the 2A receptor with LSD in there, which is probably going to be real close to the one I showed you because uh, the 2B receptor was crystallized with ergotamine. And all we have to do is superimpose LSD and ergotamine. They both have an ergot structure. And superimpose a homology model in the 2B receptor and then take away the 2B and the ergotamine, and LSD is just right where you think it would be. But for these other things where we've got methoxies, the 2,5-dimethoxies and the silicin and mescaline, there, I don't know what we, I mean, we've done a lot. And, you know, I sit, I've sat in front of this using the program, twisting these things and trying to figure out how does this make sense with our data. You, some of this stuff just doesn't make any sense. And I think what we're going to have to do is, one of the things that the mutagenesis and the modeling is good for is developing hypotheses. Because if you see, oh, we're finding this way, then we could actually go back and do some different mutations maybe or make some different ligands. And what happened, I showed the 2-hydroxy 2-CB compound. What happened was John came in, he said, you know, I'm getting funny results when I mutate this 3 and 160. I think the orthomethoxy of these compounds might be somehow interacting there. How could we test that? And so we made, we took the, metho we took the methoxy converting to hydroxy. We took the 5-methoxy converted to hydroxy. So we actually made the ligands to complement those studies and then went back and looked at it and boy, we saw a really big difference. So we're pretty sure that somehow, at least in the mutant receptors, those things are binding that way. But when you try to dock them, 
with the old models we have, the computer doesn't put them there. So we have the data that say, that say it's got to be binding this way, but the docking and the homology model are not accurate enough to say, okay, here's what's actually happening. And I hope we get that in the next year. <clears throat> so one of the things I got good at doing in my career was making rigid analogs. So this is a paper we published in ACS Chemical Neuroscience last year. So this is um, 2 CB, and on this particular day it had 6 nanomolar affinity. And we put the orthomethoxy benzyl on, it had 0.19 nanomolar affinity. We did this because bromine is a lot easier to put on these molecules than iodine, so we wanted to make a series of bromate compounds. So this is a group project. I had a bunch of students in my lab, and I gave each, of, each one of them one of these molecules and said, everybody make one of these, and let's see which one turns out to be active. <clears throat> Every one of these represents a tethered or rigidified conformation of this n-benzyl compound. So here's the compound. If you look here, here's a phenethylamine going up this way, and here's the n-benzyl coming down here. We just hooked it together here. Here's the n-benzyl, and we just hooked it together over here. Here's the n-benzyl, but we hooked it together up here. Here's the n-benzyl, we hooked it over here. Here's the n-benzyl, but we hooked it around over this way. Here's an n-benzyl, an but we hooked it around over this way. Here's an n-benzyl, and we hooked it around this way. And here's an n-benzyl, and we hooked it around this way. And this actually has a cis and trans isomer that we could, that we could separate. So we actually separated the, the cis, where they're both on the same side, which is what those two dark bonds mean and the trans, <clears throat> and we actually crystallized this isomer. So you have a trans where you have this one up and this one down, and a trans where that one's up and this one is down. So this is the one that we actually crystallized, got a crystal structure on. And this was the most potent compound that we made. So it's not as potent as this, but it's more potent than 2CB. So we concluded that probably this thing represents the orientation of the end benzyl when it binds to the receptor. So now that we have this new homology model, we're going to try to dock that in. Since it has fewer degrees of freedom, it can't move around as much as, this, as the flexible molecule and see if we can figure out where this methoxy is actually binding. So <clears throat> that's work that just finished and we'll continue with the docking studies. And also, uh, we only made a small amount of this and it was fairly tedious to make and a new synthesis was published by a French group uh, several months ago and that looks like I could probably make a lot of this. And the key the interesting thing about this molecule is it's highly serotonin 2A selective. So for all the psychedelics, they activate the serotonin 2A receptor and the serotonin 2C receptor to about the same extent. But when we made this molecule, it seemed to be very selectively activating the serotonin 2A receptor. Everybody, this is sort of a holy grail in this field, is to find a, an agonist ligand that's very selective or specific for the 2A receptor because all the psychedelics activate the 2A and the 2C receptors. And the 2C receptor functionally antagonizes the 2A. So things that 2A receptor activation does, the 2C receptor activation sort of cancels out. So we thought if we could get a 2A selective ligand that didn't have the 2C activation, maybe we would find out better what a 2A ligand does. So some of the effects that psychedelics have, like suppression of appetite or producing anxiety, et cetera, could be mediated by the 2C receptor. So a selective 2A or specific 2A receptor ligand might be a, a, a pure drug, so to speak. You might actually find out more about what the 2A receptor does without the ancillary actions of the 2C receptor activation. <coughs> so, yes. Well, you know, you could have, um, you could have, you know, flipping from chair to chair because you've got a large group. Typically, um, you know, if it was a phenyl, this would tend to want to maintain the equatorial position. The benzyl's a little bit farther away, but I suspect probably you still get some flipping. But <clears throat> in the crystal structure, we know exactly what the shape is. In the receptor, uh, when you do dynamics, um, the, the software will flip that around, and it'll give you the best fit. So we'll, we'll see if it matches the crystal structure. But um, if I get the time, I hope I can uh, work out this new synthesis and make enough of this because I think it's an interesting molecule. And in addition, um, the iodo here instead of bromine makes the compound much more potent and increases its efficacy in the other, in the simple compounds. And iodo here 
It's uh, instead of 0.2 nanomolar, it's 0.04, and it's intrinsic activity. It's ability to activate the receptor goes up. So we think the same thing will happen if we put an iodo here. That it'll be a better, more efficacious, and more potent to a ligand. <coughs> and you put that that halogen goes on as the very last step. So if I get enough of this stuff made and can iodinate with iodine, silver nitrate, then we'll have an iota there. I could trick trick Paul Bailey into making this. <coughs> um, and another question that I'm trying to work on now. Um, that I'm retired <clears throat> is what makes LSD so much more potent uh, than any of the other lysergamides. And here's a sampling. We have about 37 of these we made. And things like um, the amide, well, so this is the diethyl. We made ethyl propyl, ethyl trifluoroethyl. I mean, we just took the methyl in the end of one of the ethyls of the LSD and turned it into trifluoro, which you wouldn't think would have that big of an effect. Yes, this is a zetidide we published on years ago, and I'll show you a slide of that. Methyl isopropyl, or lamid, ethyl isopropyl, cis zetidide, the pipridide, uh, and then with some n allyl cyclopropyl methyl ethyl, where you have the diethyl, pyrrolidide, morpholide. Um, and these are sorted in terms, in, in order of uh, decreasing affinity for the 2A receptor using ketanserin as a ligand. So I just got these data about a week ago, and they're now running these with DOI as a radio ligand. So we'll get higher numbers. But here's LSD down here in the middle, and some of these others look much more potent. Uh, LSD doesn't really stand out. There's a couple receptors where the serotonin 2B receptor, no one thinks that the 2B receptor is important for uh, the psychopharmacology of LSD, but it certainly has high affinity there compared with any of the others, and that's something I've got to go back and look at again. Um, high affinity at the 1D receptor, so I just basically put boxes around things where we have single-digit affinities. But there's nothing remarkable about LSD if you look at these. And there's about a, 10 other receptors we looked at that either are low affinity or no affinity. <clears throat> so if you look at this, there's nothing obvious about uh, why LSD should be so different. So one of the tricks we did, and we did this some years ago, was to convert the diethyl amide into a dimethyl zetidine. So these ethyl groups are freely rotating. So this nitrogen carbon bond, so these can just swing around. There's nothing that locks them into place. <clears throat> and we thought, you know, maybe there's a specific place that the diethyl group binds in the receptor. And if so, then we may be able to lock the diethyl groups into different orientations and see. So what we did is constructed these um, dimethyl, 2,4-dimethyl um, uh, azetidine analogs. And so you have a four-membered ring with a nitrogen, and you have a methyl group here and here. And those methyl groups can either be cis on the same side. I don't think I meant to do that. It's high-tech stuff. I'm a low-tech person. I'm a, I'm a techn technological dinosaur. Um, <clears throat> so you have cis with both methyl groups up or both methyl groups down. That's the same isomer because this can flip around. And you have an SS and an RR where they're trans, they're across. One's up and one's down, or one's down and one's up. And they're stereoisomers that we could resolve. So we made the cis, meso, dimethyl azetidine, the RR, and the SS trans, and then coupled it to the lysergic acid and made these. So if you look at the front, this is a front view of LSD, and there are two possible orientations of the ethyl groups. In this one, this front ethyl is projected down, the back ethyl is projected up. In this one, the front ethyl is projected up and the back ethyl is projected down. This is the dimethyl azetidines. This is the RR isomer and the SS isomer, and they're locked. They can't move. So this one, the front methyl is projected down, corresponding to this conformation of LSD, and this one is projected up, corresponding to this. So LSD, the ethyl groups can move, but in the dimethyl azetidines, they can't move. They're locked. So we have two mimics of two different conformations of those extremes of LSD. Here's the top view. So LSD, we have one where the front ethyl is projected over here, the back ethyl is over here. And you just flip these around. The front ethyl is over here, the back ethyl is over here. And this is the top view of the sit of the azetidides, where the front one's down, and the back one's up, and the front one's down, and the back one's up. You can see the relationship between these two. And then we tested these along with the cis isomer, <clears throat> and it was this SS azetidide that had the LSD-like activity. So that 
led us to conclude that when LSD binds to its receptor, that it's this particular orientation of the ethyl groups that's important for binding, and that there's a place in the receptor that accommodates the diethyl groups. <clears throat> and so then we did neogenesis studies. These, again, are from uh, my last student. We haven't published them. So here's LSD, here's the SS, here's the RR, and here's the cis. And what you can see as you go across here is that of the mutagenesis effects we had, this is conversion, this is up in extracellular loop 2. So um, off the top of helix 4 going into helix uh, 5, there's a loop. And so these are in that, residues in that loop. <clears throat> so we mutate leucine 228, leucine 229, or alanine 230. And what you see is with these mutations, we see essentially the same effect with the SSZ as azetidine that we saw with LSD. Um, out here, there's a slight difference. But basically, you see a parallel. Whereas with the RR, we see a different profile. With the cis, there's a different profile. So this was confirmation that in terms of the way it binds to the receptor, that the SSZ azetidine was affected in the same way by these mutations. We actually think that this uh, leucine-229 is a critical residue not only in this receptor, but in many GPCRs. There's a big hydrophobic residue at the corresponding position, and people have started to look at that, but uh, we think that's important for the activity of lysergamides. <coughs> and here's some that we ran through, and you can see in every case, when we convert that uh, leucine into a serine, which is very polar, we go from a hydrophobic leucine to a serine, you see it has a very detrimental effect on affinity, with the exception of lyceride, which is not hallucinogenic is a completely different orderly shape. <clears throat> so this is just to illustrate that um, if you convert that into a polar group, you really mess up the binding of all of these lysergamides. And we think in terms of the model, this is our earlier homology model, <clears throat> that when you dock it, here's this leucine 229 in extracellular loop 2 coming down. It comes down and interacts along with some other residues with the diethyl amide. And if you look at actually space filling representation, it looks like that. So there's actually a space in the receptor, we think, that has evolved with the amino acids that just, just uh, perfectly complements the orientation of the diethyl amide of LSD, sort of a fortuitous uh, thing that our brains have evolved, a receptor that uniquely uh, recognizes LSD for whatever reason. I'm getting the philosophy. <clears throat> So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the in vivo stuff because Franz Wollenweider can run rings around me when it comes to this. But just basically, uh, I've been talking a lot about receptor effects, but you know, how does that affect consciousness? And uh, we basically have uh, secondary consciousness. Uh, we can do language and we're self-reflective, most of us. Abstract thinking, some of us. Uh, and so <clears throat> how does that happen? And if we believe that there are neurocorrelates of consciousness, that consciousness arises from neurochemical and electrophysiological physiological functions in the brain, and there were people who would argue with me on that, I know, but I go from that uh, reductionist uh, point of view. It's the neurochemistry that makes it work. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to learn about the physiology of a system, you use drugs that perturb the system. So that's pharmacology. If you want to know what the beta receptor in the heart does, you give an animal beta receptor agonist and you see what happens. Heart rate goes up. Oh, beta receptors must stimulate the heart. So the hypothesis is uh, to study consciousness, you can use agents that perturb consciousness. That is psychedelics. And most people now would argue that this may be a really important use for psychedelics in the scientific context is to study consciousness and how it modifies consciousness and how different drugs and different combinations of antagonists, how you can tease apart some of what's going on in the brain with respect to consciousness. Now here's a slide I've somewhat used before, but I have to use it again. One pill makes you larger, and one pill makes you small. And the ones that mother gives you don't do anything at all. Go ask Alice when she... Plus, it took me a long time to do it. So when you activate a serotonin 2 to a receptor, I mean, that sounds pretty reductionist. How can that modify consciousness? I mean, where, what, in, what about is in the brain? And let me point out that visual distortions do not a psychedelic make, and that's not a grammatical thing. Uh, you know, uh, Heinrich Luber 
um, years ago wrote a book where he talked about uh, universal characteristics of drug-induced imagery where you have whirls and things like that. And there are mathematical models that, that will show you how that can, you can come up with that. But it turns out um, a few years ago <coughs> that they showed that primary visual cortex uh, has high expression levels of serotonin 2A receptors. So this is primary visual cortex uh, in uh, primates. It's in the back part of the brain. It's uh, V1. It's where all your information goes. And these are um, patterns that were produced in cat brain by showing them um, these patterns. And so you see different electrical activation patterns within the primary visual cortex based on these patterns. Well, conversely, if you activate receptors, it might not be surprising if you got those, res those kinds of patterns. So here's uh, what Wat Watakabe did in 2009. They used a double uh, in situ histochemical fluorescence, fluorescent immunostaining, to look at serotonin uh, 1D and 2A receptors. Serotonin 1D receptors <coughs> are located on presynaptic neuron terminals that are autoreceptors that regulate the release of serotonin. So if you see those there, then there's some postsynaptic receptor. So there's 2A receptors. So what they did is label the 1D receptors with uh, a green fluorescent um, protein and the 2A receptors with a red fluorescent. And green and red, when you merge them, they're complementary colors. You get yellow. So they're just showing that these two 1B receptors are in the same location as the 2A receptors. And this is in layer uh, four of the primary visual cortex. So they're densely expressed the 5-HT2A receptor. So when people talk about curtains waving and the walls breathing and stuff like that, it's probably not so much an effect initially on consciousness as it actually is a direct effect on primary visual processing in V1. <clears throat> but that's not what psychedelic means. And so here's some quotes from anecdotal reports. The psilocybin session was like years of therapy. I'd been therapy for 10 years. I took MDMA once and everything. I'd been running from this there out in the open. Suddenly I was overcome with all, merged with this loving energy. Maybe it was God, but I knew at that instant there was no I, but only all. We were all part of one universal consciousness. This is not coming from 5 h 2 receptors in visual cortex. <coughs> so just a brief word about the brain. Um, you know that in terms of evolution, um, evolutionarily the spinal cord was there first, and then the hindbrain, cerebellum, midbrain, and forebrain. The forebrain cortex is what makes us unique as organisms compared with others. Uh, certainly higher primates, orangutans, baboons, gorillas, etc., have a cortex but not as well developed as ours. And so we have all these areas. Here's the primary visual cortex, uh, learning and memory here, uh, sensory data, somatosensory cortex, premotor. And so typically people have thought about uh, the effects of these drugs in primary in, in the frontal cortex because that's really what makes us different from other lower organisms is the fact that we have such a well-developed cortex. <clears throat> and it turns out that serotonin 2A receptors are densely expressed in a whole bunch of areas that are responsible for the way that we perceive things and the way we interpret things. So in the reticular system, in the Raffe system, we have serotonin being released. There are 2A receptors there, but it's released into uh, all the areas of the forebrain from the uh, Raffe nuclei and the reticular system. The ventral tegmental uh, area, VTA, is a dopamine cell, group of cell bodies that has serotonin 2A receptors on it. Uh, the locus ceruleus is a noradrenergic group of cell bodies that releases norepinephrine. It has serotonin 2A receptors uh, located on it. The thalamus and the reticular nucleus of the thalamus uh, gate information that goes to the cortex. And the reticular nucleus especially has serotonin 2A receptors in it. <clears throat> and then the cortex has serotonin 2A receptors. So if you think of the cortex as being the organ that really is where abstract thinking and executive function occurs, et cetera, it's affected by all these lower areas, the thalamus gating information that gets through, the locus ceruleus, which I'll talk about briefly, the ventral tegmental area, the reticular system, are all affected. They all have serotonin 2A receptors densely expressed. So they're all affected by these drugs. So you have this, it's not just one area that's affected, it's, every, it's the cortex and everything that actually modulates the cortex both uh, going forward and going back, serotonin 2A receptors are very important in that whole process. <clears throat> I won't spend any time on this, but this is a typical work from Edelman and, and other people and Rodolfo Linas. Uh, but basically, their thoughts are that consciousness is related to oscillatory properties of thalamocortical loops. So 
these oscillating loops, thalmocortical stridal, I guess Franz would add stridal loops in there too probably, but um, that there are these interacting loops that are in a kind of a dynamic uh, operation. And so you can imagine anything that's operating in a dynamic way. If you perturb it, you're going to have ripples of effects depending on how you perturb it. And the wiring diagram, which I'm not competent to even interpret, but just to show you a schematic of how this all might hook together. This is a figure I put in a 2004 paper, a review I did on hallucinogens, just to illustrate the fact that you have serotonin 2A receptors in the Rafa, the locus ceruleus, the ventral tegmental area. All the sensory information that comes in other than olfaction goes through the thalamus. The reticular nucleus is an area wrapped around the thalamus that sends inhibitory GABA projections in. There are a lot of serotonin 2A receptors here, which gives serotonergic activation from the Rafa system. Uh, <coughs> and going through the primary somatosensory cortex into the uh, frontal cortex in layer five, we have these pyramidal cells, which are activated by serotonin and norepinephrine as well. And serotonin coming from the Rafe, we have dopamine coming in and norepinephrine from the locus ceruleus. So serotonin 2A receptors affect this whole thing. And if you remember that one cell I showed from a thalamic nuclei earlier that had all the dendrites on it, and the whole brain is constructed pretty much like that, Imagine if you go in and you affect any one of these areas, these brainstem areas, or midbrain areas, they're going to affect the processing of the whole system. So I don't think you could predict the effect they would have, but it's maybe not surprising when you realize that this 2A receptor is densely expressed in all these critical areas that something would happen if you activate it. Yeah. Yeah. There is, 2C, there is 2C receptor in the cortex. Um, it, uh, it's in the uh, clostrum. It modulates the uh, uh, ionic composition of cerebrospinal fluid. And I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, it is involved in dopamine regulation. Um, but it's not to the extent that, that the 2A is. And when you can block the effects of psychedelics with the 2A antagonists in animals and in humans or in receptors, it's basically that's why I said we want to get a pure 2A agonist just to see. But uh, a lot of people are working on the 2C. I haven't followed that literature that well. But um, it's not located in these same areas to the extent the 2A receptor is. So this is from a paper that came out of Synapse in 2011 where they mapped out uh, innervation from the dorsal raphe into the reticular nucleus of the thalamus. So these 5-HD2A receptors are shown in, in blue. So we have tracks that go from the Rafe up into the reticular nucleus of the thalamus. <clears throat> and it wraps around. It's a, it's a thin layer of cells that wraps around the thalamus. So all these thalamic nuclei are responsible for processing certain types of sensory information. And the reticular nucleus uh, gets input from the Rafe and from other areas. And it sends inhibitory GABA projections into these different nuclei. So it sort of controls the flow of information through the thalamus. It goes to the cortex. And this is a, sort of a, a more graphic diagram. So here's the thal thalamic nuclei, and here's the reticular nucleus that wraps around it. So all these things project into visual processing, motor, et cetera. And so if you uh, have 2A receptors in there, if this thing is actually part of what gates the information that goes through these different nuclei, and it, process it goes out to the cortex for processing, then obviously you're basically throwing a wrench in the gears of your sensory processing if you're affecting that at that level. <clears throat> the locus ceruleus is, a, uh, is involved in vigilance and also serves as a novelty detector. So in a cat uh, or rat uh, that's anesthetized, if you present an odor, you see firing in the olfactory cortex, you see firing. And then if you stimulate the locus ceruleus and present the same odor, you get much more dramatic firing. This is active waking drowsiness, and you see firing of the locus ceruleus. So um, the locus ceruleus will burst fire in response to novelty. So this odor will be novelty, so you see these burst firing. And if you stimulate locus ceruleus, you get uh, even more firing. So the way I rationalized that was uh, if you uh, are sitting in here listening to me and somebody in the back falls down and drops a whole bunch of papers, and everybody turns around, your locus ceruleus is the one that's been activated and has told you to focus your attention on whatever's happening back there. 
So uh, people that take psychedelics will say, yeah, you know, everything looked new, like, uh, like a flower looked like they'd never seen it before. Well, that could be increased firing in the locus ruleus because it's the psychedelics make it first fire more easily in response to novelty. So it could be telling your brain, well, this is something that's interesting you should pay attention to. So it may be just rate of firing of locus ruleus, which seems very reductionist. But anyway, um, <coughs> locus ruleus sends projections to the prefrontal cortex, the ventral tegmental area. The nucleus accumbens is also part of the reward pathway. Uh, these are other adrenergic nuclei in the brain stem that uh, uh, I don't know that there are serotonin 2 receptors there, but there are in the locus ruleus, so you have this a complex interaction between locus ruleus, PFC, VTA. It's what? This is adrenergic, no, no adrenergic now. I don't know where the GABA neurons play in here. Obviously, there's going to be some GABA in the neurons that are also going to control this. But just, I just want to point out that locus ruleus has a high density of 5 h 2 a receptors, and it's involved in uh, noradrenergic regulation of prefrontal cortex. Uh, the alpha receptors on the, the cortical pyramidal cells have the same signaling pathway or co-expressed with the 2A receptors. So adrenergic activation in the cortex from the LC would have an effect that would be either additive or synergistic with 2A receptor activation. Those are those uh, two. There are those two uh, adrenergic nuclei that are stretched down into the medulla. Um, I forget what the names are, but they're they're noradrenergic, and uh, they actually where locus ruleus is a group of cell bodies in the brain, in the midbrain brainstem. They actually stretch down into the medulla more. They're they're elongated. They've got weird names. That's why they, they call them A1, A2. If you go and read the paper, they'll list the name, and then they just call them A1 and A2 after that. <clears throat> and so all of these areas, the locus ceruleus, uh, the raphe, et cetera, are all involved in cortical arousal, waking, non-REM, sleep. And I'm not going to go through this, um, but um, all of these areas in, in higher, uh, the higher brain are affected when you activate these lower brainstem areas that have 2A receptors in them. Uh, the cortex has 2A receptors um, in these pyramidal cells. Uh, they're shaped like almost like little pyramids. In this dark, this is immunostaining of the 2A receptor. This is the apical dendrite that comes off of the pyramidal cell body. And this is a, a section um, of the cortex through layers one through six. The layer five is where the pyramidal cells typically are that the 2A receptors are expressed on. There are a lot of GABA interneurons, a lot of other things going on. So this is a, a sort of simplified section. And this is a picture that will give you a chance to uh, relax a minute. This is a tour through the mouse somatosensory cortex, if I can get it to run. all the way down through. I wanted to get, if we could get through the 
version of QuickTime on my laptop to make it work. And that may be the problem here. It may not be the latest version of might be by now, I don't know. Yeah. Hmm? Um, I can get the reference. I don't have it on this slide. And here's a picture that Franz Bolenweider will remember from a few years ago. Yeah, many years, courtesy of Franz showing that um, using FDG PET that the cortex was activated after psilocybin, so cortical activation. And Franz will have more to say about that, I'm sure, this afternoon. <clears throat> and uh, the effect of psychedelics has been compared to lucid dreaming. So here's a REM sleep EEG and a waking EEG, and so presumably the psychedelic effect would, would look something like that. Here's another interesting one. We'll see if this runs. This is a four-second thalamocortical simulation model with a million neurons and five times 10 to the synapses. And the red dots are excitatory neurons and the black ones are inhibitory. So this is 1 20th real time. The entire animation would take four seconds. This is a simplified representation of theoretical cortical activity. It would be great to see this in real time on a human before and after psilocybin, if there was any way to do it. MEG would be close, wouldn't it? 
hydrogel hydrogel technique have application? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. And just uh, finally, talk about one of the unique things about the pharmacology of LSD that we found in animals. And Daniel Friedman was uh, one of the early clinical LSD researchers. He was at the University of Chicago, and I saw him at several meetings. And he would tell me, you know, Dave, um, what's striking is that these people that we give LSD to. Uh, for, for the first four to six hours, they really enjoy it, and it's really nice. And then somewhere about after four to six hours, there's a second phase where they exhibit symptoms that look very much like amphetamine psychosis, paranoid psychosis. They become suspicious with ideas of reference or paranoid conviction. And nobody ever studied it. And that stuck in my mind <clears throat> for many years. And we did some experiments that... Recall, it made me recall what he said, and so I thought, well, let's see if this happens in rats. Is there any basis for the pharmacology of LSD changing? So can we model it in animals? So this is drug discrimination, um, and basically you put an animal in here, and you have two operant, uh, two levers in an operant chamber, and you, uh, if they press one lever, you give them food, 50 milligram sucrose pellets. Like it's sugar, rat candy. And if they press the other, nothing happens. So you can train rats to press a lever, one of these levers selectively, after being administered a CNS active drug. So we've used MDMA and amphetamine and lots of things. You can do it with LSD. So suppose we put the rat in here and we give him LSD and we turn on the right lever and he discovers eventually if he presses the right lever, he gets a little food pellet delivered in this little trough. And if he presses the left lever, nothing happens. And we put him in there the next day and we give him uh, nothing, and we turn on the left lever, and if he presses the right lever, nothing happens. And then we put him the next day, we give him LSD, and we turn on the right lever, and he presses it, he gets a food pellet, presses the left lever, nothing happens. So over a period of two, three months, you can train the rats to press the lever when they get the drug. And if you don't give them the drug, they always press the saline lever. And this is a fairly powerful uh, behavioral technique because the doses you use are much lower than the doses you would use for other kinds of behaviors. And also the rat won't respond on the training lever unless you give a drug that's like the training drug. So if we train these rats to recognize the effects of LSD and we then give them amphetamine, they, they press on the non-drug lever. So we use this uh, to basically give the rats new LSD analogs we made or DOI analogs or whatever. And if they were trained LSD, we'd put them in and we'd simply observe which lever they would press on and use appropriate data analysis and statistical techniques. We put them in and we gave them something and it was like LSD. Then the rat would press the LSD lever. And basically, he was saying, you know, I think you gave me LSD. And that's the best we could ever get. I had lots of volunteers to take the drugs we made, but, um, it, you know, un unlike uh, Sasha, I never was able to pull that off in a pharmacy school in the Midwest. Anyway, and it's not actually a bad procedure. So here, here are some compounds that we've tested in both drug discrimination and we knew the potency in humans. So potency relative LSD and the rat drug discrimination. So you go down the list and you see we go from ethylad, which is more potent than LSD in drug discrimination, down to mescaline, which is pretty weak. And then look at potency relative LSD in humans. And so you see we see a roughly correspondence. So drug discrimination at least gave us an approximation of whether the drug was going to have LSD-like effects and its relative potency in humans. So we had always tested rats by giving them LSD, waiting 30 minutes, and then putting them in this chamber and then doing the training procedure. So they learned to recognize the cue after 30 minutes of LSD administration. And this is the time cue curve. So we gave the drug 30 minutes after, and we looked at uh, responding and it drops off. So by two hours, it's completely gone. By 90 minutes, it's below our criteria of 80%. So I had my research associate train animals and give LSD 90 minutes afterward just to see is there some delayed phase like Friedman had reported in humans. <clears throat> and this is what we got and when we gave LSD 90 minutes after. At the same and at the same dose, we used LSD 30. 
we saw that we had a different profile, that the activity shows up optimally at 90 minutes and doesn't drop off until 240 minutes. And was it the same effect that LSD had when we waited only 30 minutes before training? So <clears throat> this is the LSD 30 rats, and this is the LSD 90 rats. <coughs> M10907 is a serotonin 2A receptor antagonist. And haloperidol is a dopamine D2 receptor blocker. So in LSD30 rats, if we pretreat them with haloperidol, not much happens over the dose of the antagonist. But if we give them M10907, we can block the Q, which we knew that LSD30 was mediated by serotonin 2A receptor activation, and we could block that effect with a serotonin 2A receptor blocker. But in the LSD90 rats, when we gave them haloperidol, Instead of having no effect, it blocked the Q. And M1907 had less of an effect. And it turns out the rat 5-HT2 receptor is slightly different than the human 5-HT2A receptor. And this drug, MDL11939, is more specific for the 2A receptor in rats. And so when we gave this one, it had absolutely no effect. So in the LSD30 rats, we could block the effect with a 2A antagonist, but not with a dopamine D2 antagonist. The LSD90 rats, we could block the effect with a dopamine D2 antagonist but not with the serotonin 2A antagonist. So the nature of what the rats were perceiving had completely changed from activation of 2A receptors to activation of dopamine receptors. <clears throat> and then we um, did a bunch of discrimination tests. So what you can do is, once these rats are trained to discriminate LSD, you give them other drugs and see, do they respond as if uh, they were uh, given LSD? So the LSD, this is the LSD90Q, quinelarain, is a very potent D2, D3 agonist. And so this is the percent lever selection with dose. And you see, we, this was a very steep dose response curve. We gave al almost no, no increased increment at all, and we got full responding with a D2 agonist. LSD90, we of course get the full response. LSD30, we don't get the full response. Um, DOI, we don't get the full response. But n dihydroxidine, this is a selective D2 receptor agonist that we developed. We get full receptor activation, full discrimination, and also with apomorphine, which is a non-selective dopamine D2 antagonist, we get full substitution. So the drugs that substituted for LSD were dopamine agonist rather than serotonin 2A agonist. And <clears throat> it also uh, proved to be the case that when we gave these rats LSD at that dose repeatedly, their activity changed and they became hyperactive. We actually uh, have been developing this as a potential uh, animal model schizophrenia. Chronic administration of this dose of LSD over a period of time produces some permanent behavioral changes. One of them is increased locomotor activity. If you plot it out, it looks like this. Unfortunately, the lighting in the room, rats are, uh, they're photophobic. They stay, like to stay in dark places. So you can see this, uh, and there are fewer movements over here. The light was shining over in this region, so over here. But you can see LSD-30, versus LSD-90, they move a whole lot more. So each one of these little uh, sections is a rat moving from one position to another over a period of uh, about an hour. And so you can see they're much more active after LSD in the 90, LSD-90 treatment versus LSD-30 treatment. Yeah. That's one of the things that uh, uh, if you large doses of amphetamine, large doses of PCP, the animal models of schizophrenia, which don't necessarily have face validity, but that's one of the marks of the animal models that we use now is hyperlocomotion. In schizophrenics, but in it, but in animal models, that's what they've used, PCP and amphetamine. So we just saw increased uh, locomotion. So we're just saying, and it's an animal model, maybe this would be useful as an animal model for psychosis. Um, also, the response rates are higher. So LSD-30 rates, LSD-30 rates here versus LSD-90 over a period of several years. And you see the rates of responding for LSD-90 over LSD-30 are increased. So they're, they're more reactive. They respond faster. And LSD-30 was comparable to DOI, MMAI, or even to some extent amphetamine, whereas the LSD-90 rats were much more, responding much more uh, quickly. And then we found LSD was a potent dopamine D4 agonist. So this is a dose response curve for uh, inhibiting forceful and stimulated cyclic AMP accumulation. 
Quinpro is sort of the standard D2 agonist. Here's a dose response curve for that. And here's LSD. The EC50s are almost identical. So we found that LSD was functionally a dopamine D4 agonist. So this may be partly why it's different than other psychedelics too, because the other psychedelics don't activate dopamine receptors directly. <clears throat> and so one of the other things we found earlier was that if you uh, pre-treated animals with DOI or LSD two to three hours before you gave them a dopaminergic agent, they were uh, at increased sensitivity. So we had rats trained to discriminate amphetamine. And <clears throat> when we gave them a standard dose of amphetamine, uh, after we gave uh, DOI or LSD treatment, you can see we had an increased responding compared with the saline pretreatment. So it occurred to us that what might be happening with LSD is that LSD was stimulating 5-HT2A receptors. And then over a certain period of time, then these uh, receptor systems were sensitized. The dopamine system was sensitized. And now the dopaminergic effects of LSD could be coming into play. And then we proposed that it might actually be a metabolite of LSD, uh, which was this 13-hydroxy. We built up a pretty strong theoretical case that this 13-hydroxy LSD should have uh, potent dopaminergic effects. <coughs> there are a couple of literature reports, not of LSD, but of some uh, a related ergoline, lurgatrol, and uh, an isotryptamine, where when they put hydroxy here, the dopaminergic activity increased about 100-fold. So we thought if we made this and tested it, um, that would be that would sort of prove it. So what we would have is in drug discrimination, initially activation of 2A receptors, but then that produces a sensitization of the dopaminergic system. And then if this uh, dopamine metabolite accumulates, then you would see the shift to uh, from, from serotonin to dopamine pharmacology. This was the last project that I worked on in my lab um, before retiring. Uh, there was a fellow at Brandeis University had reported a new synthesis of, LS, of lysergic acid, and we thought we could use the synthesis to uh, make it and put a methoxy here, because you have to build the whole molecule if you can't just introduce this hydroxy uh, easily. And after we spent uh, two years of two different postdocs time, we finally concluded that his, his graduate student had faked the data. And we published that paper saying it was fake. It was very, uh, very annoying to me because I thought we had a really interesting hypothesis to test. I had people lined up to uh, take blood samples and people who had been given LSD and analyze them for a hydroxy metabolite and correlate that with uh, behavioral states. But anyway, um, and another thing that uh, my son, who has been doing some work in this field, found when he started, he's at LSU at the medical center, and he hired a postdoc who had been working in their cardiovascular center. And they were working with rat uh, arterial smooth muscle cells, uh, looking at models of uh, chronic um, cardiovascular disease. And his postdoc had some of these cells grown up and said to my son, um, is there anything we could assay in these cells? Because I've got them grown up and they're really expensive. And Chuck said, no, I don't think so. And he had not got his Schedule One license, but he wanted to work with serotonin to a agonist. He said, have you got any serotonin to a agonists that are not controlled substances? And I said, well, DOI is not. So I sent him some RDOI. And so uh, he had that. And so his post postdoc, uh, you, a uh, Chinese guy, said, well, how about this compound? And Chuck laughed because the model this guy had was a model of inflammation, cardiovascular or arterial inflammation. Chuck laughed says, no, nothing will happen. But, you know, if you're going to destroy the cells, you can test it. The guy came back a week later and said, oh, it was a really potent anti-inflammatory, and the concentration that was affecting these cells was 20 picomolar. And just to put that in context, uh, it's been estimated that the concentration of LSD in the brain uh, after an effective dose is between 20 and 40 nanomolar. So 20 picomolar is a thousand-fold smaller concentration than that. So it was unprecedented that DOI would have any effects at 20 picomolar. The receptor occupancy at that concentration is so low as to be almost uncalculable. But this is actually what happened. So he had, what he, the way the assay worked is um, they took these cells, they put in uh, TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which initiates a whole cascade of uh, pro-inflammatory markers. And so here's the effect of TNF-alpha unopposed. <coughs> and here's one nanomolar. DOI put in, it completely blocks the inflammatory response produced by TNF-alpha. And interestingly, he, took the T, he looked at TCB2 uh, <clears throat> and looked at the azeridine, the LSD azeridine, which I talked about earlier, and also LSD. None of these are as potent as DOI in this uh, inflammatory response. 
when he goes up to 50 nanomolar, it's comparable. But 50 nanomolar is a whole lot more than uh, than one nanomolar, right? So, so this is something he continues to look at, and I understand he's been able to block the induction of asthma in a rat model of asthma with DOI. So the serotonin 2A receptor, in addition to these central nervous system effects, may have very useful anti-inflammatory effects if this pans out. So that's something that I uh, just call your attention to. And this is just uh, actually <coughs> showing what happened in cells where they were looking at uh, the activation translocation of NF-kappa B P65 transcription activator. So when you, uh, act when you activate this, all the uh, P6 the, the NF-kappa B goes into the nucleus. And so you see all this uh, sort of diffuse labeling through here, and it goes, these nuclei are, are not staining. After you put in TNF-alpha, it all transfers into the nucleus because it's a transcription factor that turns on transcription of RNA. And so when they put in DOI, you see it blocked that translocation of the transcription factor into the nucleus. Again, this is from that paper they published. And this was a featured paper in JPET in 2008. So it's really remarkable. So it may well be that you'll see some psychedelics used as a potent anti-inflammatories in the near future. And then finally, just to mention that um, I did uh, found the Hefter Institute in 1993. And this was the first paper that we published on the treatment, actually therapeutic uh, treatment of psilocybin in uh, end-stage cancer patients. You're probably all aware this was out, I think, in 2010 by Charlie Grobe and his team at UCLA Harbor. And uh, basically, uh, it looked like we got uh, positive effects. And as you may, some of you may know, that study has been expanded in New York University and also at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Um, and also, uh, in those that we've been making presentations on that today, and also a pilot study of psilocybin and alcoholism, and uh, also in uh, uh, smoking cessation. So Hefter Institute, I couldn't do clinical stuff. I was doing basic stuff, but the clinical stuff was really exciting. So this was a way for me to, to live vicariously in the clinical realm. And just to thank, uh, I trained, I think, 45 graduate students, and I had 20 or so postdocs over the years. And John McCord was my last student who did most of this data. Marcus Lill was a computational chemist. And uh, some other people, Mike Bray, and my research associate who did the behavior. And NIDA funded my studies for 28, almost 29 years. Um, so I'm grateful for their funding, although they weren't hoping that we'd come up with anything useful. <coughs> And uh, I checked with George Greer, a medical director of Hefter, to see how much we had supported. And as of right now, we have uh, spent $3.4 $3 million on research of psychedelics. We have commitments for a lot more donors to give a lot more. And uh, probably most of you have heard of the Hefter Institute, but not as much as some other organizations. And that's because we're a virtual institute. We don't spend any money on publicity or anything like that. Most of the, almost all the money that we get goes directly to support research. So if you go to our website, I think we've got 50 some, in excess of 50 publications of research that we've supported. And uh, all the clinical work with psilocybin has been basically supported by Hefter. And uh, we're moving toward, uh, we're meeting with a consultancy group now and doing the things it's going to take to uh, move toward getting psilocybin approved as a drug for end stage uh, distress in dying patients. That's the initial indication. And, uh, Hopefully within five to ten years uh, we'll get there, uh, but so far things are looking pretty good. So with that, I will finish my part of the workshop. It's noon, perfect timing. And uh, thank you for staying awake.